Okay. Now, now it says, says I'm live. A minute ago, it wasn't, wasn't live. live. So, so that's, that's just, just really weird. weird. Um, um, welcome. welcome. I'm, I'm hoping, hoping this will be, be uh, a successful, successful uh, stream. stream. I, last time, I spent about, about a week, week putting, putting together, together what I need to, to just uh, set, set this up so I could show you what I'm doing. Um, what I'm but, doing. Um, um, and but, I thought it was um, all organized. And I thought it was all organized. But this morning, uh, this morning, when I went to set it all up uh, again, I, set it all up again. I had a couple working. of things that so weren't working. So in the, night, the middle of the night, the, uh, the uh, technology, technology decided, decided to, to, to mess up on me. On me. Hi, Sasha. Hi, Sasha. Nice, nice to see you. you. My, My stream, stream has, has an, an echo. echo. Okay, let's, let's just see. see. Uh, maybe this is the reason. Okay. I'm hoping. That will work. Let me just try this. Hi, Jerry. Here. Now you can hear me here. Okay. Hopefully that's clear now. Um, I got reverb. Okay. Okay. I think I hopefully fixed that. Hey, Stefan. Nice to see you. Um, okay. So. Before I had like a, you know, what do you call these things? Um, like a, a, a webcam set up to show you what I was doing. This time I'm using my iPad uh, because some, however, the, my webcam decided that it was going to give me trouble today. So anyhow, uh, what can you do? Uh, so I've been scrambling tangling and untangling myself through wires to see if I can make this bloody thing work. And uh, it's hard enough to paint without having to deal with all this other technology. You know, what happened to the days of sitting with a paintbrush in hand and, you know, just sitting outside and uh, maybe having the odd person look over your shoulder? Well, this way, in theory, hundreds of people can look over your shoulder. So that's good. Um, if you go to uh, a symposium or if you go, well, maybe not a symposium, um, like a, a workshop where you've got someone famous like Richard Schmidt uh, and you've got like 50 or 60 people trying to see what the guy is doing, it's a little bit tough. So at least this way um, you have kind of front of a front row seat. So just to, again, introduce myself, I'm Andrew. For those of you who haven't uh, done this before, or you weren't here last week, I'm hoping to do this every week if possible, depending on my schedule. And um, it's um, it's challenging because you know I'm going to have to come up with a lot of different paintings over the the this coming year. Um, Stefan managed to do it quite nicely, so good for him. He does it twice a week in some cases. And I think you're doing one a little, a pretty shortly, uh, if I'm not well, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, this is just freebie. Um, I'm just painting, and I'm I just get my button gear, doing something on a Friday afternoon. For about twenty years or so, uh, a bunch of us would get together, a bunch of guys, and have lunch and you know we talk about nothing um, or politics which is the same as nothing uh, maybe sports which I couldn't get into because I didn't really grow up a lot with sports so anyhow um, we can't do that right now because we can't you know visit so it's not fun uh, but this is fun uh, at least I'm painting and doing something productive um, Today I'm going to try to paint something like a looter kind of thing. Um, this is a, it's a photo. Well, I've, I've got a photo that you know, we were in Poland, and, and it's kind of out in the wild a little bit, and kind of a neat shack. Um, so I think give it a try. If at some point in time I can figure out the technology to actually show photo 
I'm painting that would be good. Um, I have to share my screen and um, this is, you know, one day more. I'll try to get better at this as I go. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask anyone who's listening, if you're signed in, uh, just let me know where you're from. That would be kind of neat. Um, if someone was here from Florida last week, and I know there was some from uh, Europe and, and Canada, of course. But, um, yeah, it'd be good to, to know where everyone's coming from. Um, I know where Stefan is, and I roughly know where Jerry is, so, and Sasha, too. So uh, I'm going to switch the camera on this. And um, I'm going to be painting over leftover painting. Um, in fact, it's not completely dry, which is something a little bit different. Um, usually, I like to let it dry a lot. It's fresh enough that it's almost like an ala prima. I just put this down. Some of it's old and it's dry, and then some of the other stuff's a little bit wet on top of it. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I, I'm once I need to focus, I'll probably talk less. And so then you can put some music on behind you. You won't fall asleep unless uh, it's sleepy music. Um, all right. I see uh, Sasha here is uh, from Essen, a small city in Germany's Ruhrput, if I'm saying that the right way. Uh, welcome from Germany. It's great. Um, and I'm seeing Angelica from Austria. Uh, nice to see you. It's really neat to know that you can actually communicate this way, you know, across the ocean, and it's practically instantaneous. It's a remarkable thing. Who would have believed it? All right, so I'm going to turn the camera around. I'll show you what I've got going here. Uh, And I'll have to adjust this just a little bit. So that's kind of what I'm going to be painting into. I think that shows okay. All right. And maybe, I don't know, I can try. I'm going to just move this up a little bit. I don't know actually what I'll do. I'll take this right off the stand. And I'm going to show you the kind of thing I'm going to attempt to paint. That's on my iPad above. So... I'll see if I can do this. It'll be kind of fun. Um, painting people is definitely trickier, and especially when it's someone you know. <laughs> um, it shouldn't be tougher when it's someone you know, because you'd think the features would be known to you, but in fact, I think sometimes it's tougher to paint someone you do know, because uh, we have this idea that we think we know exactly what they look like and we don't simplify into shapes and values the same way we just say well I know what that person's nose looks like so all right um, I'm listening and this is a delay it's a little disconcerting but there we go all right so when I look at the image that I'm painting from um, I really like to squint down on it, see where the dark areas are, the, the lightest areas. And um, I'm going to try and incorporate as much as I can this abstraction in, into this painting because I, I like some of the stuff that's going on. It's very textural. This is actually a piece of thick card, which I put a, a gesso over top of. And it's a long time ago, I would... I would take card with me when I was out uh, painting outdoors because it's lighter. Um, and it leaves these really interesting textures when you put a heavy gesso on. Uh, and then you take a palette knife and go over that with your leftover paint. And you get these really cool little lines and things that happen that feel somewhat natural. Whatever you don't like, you just paint over it. That's the idea, anyhow. And... Um, Sometimes that means painting over the whole thing when I'm done because it didn't work. But let's just see what we can do. Um, I'm going to try something here. I'm going to take a fairly big brush 
and I'm going to put a, a thin wash of a, a blue over the top to see if I can make it feel like a bit of sky peeking through. So um, if I do this in a really thin way, I'm going to take a little bit of uh, cobalt blue. When I say really thin, I mean really thin. You can see this on the palette. I've got the image up larger. It was the last time I think I had them both equal sizes, and it was, it was kind of odd. It's a little bit of this. I'm using a combination of uh, linseed oil and thinner paint thinner. I'm just going to try a section here just to see what that looks like. Oh, huh, it's not too bad. All right, so I'm just going to go right over what's here. The paint that's underneath is dry, at least in this section. And I think I can go in just a little bit more chroma than that. It's a little darker up top. This is very thin. And as it comes to the bottom, or the lower part of the sky, it tends to warm up a little bit. So I'm going to put in a little bit of manganese blue. Stefan loves that I use manganese blue. It just has this... Uh, I'm teasing, because he's a, not a big fan of that. He'd rather use Thalo. So, to each their own, and it works for him, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is almost done. All right. Okay. Hi, Baron. Nice to see you. Um, the board is, um, it's not very big. It's about, uh, 24 by 30 centimeter, something like that. It's not, yeah, it's not a huge one. Um, one of the challenges when I paint something larger is I have to get back further and my iPad is between the, uh, the painting and me. So I'm kind of looking around the corner of my iPad while I paint. So if, if I paint on something really, really large, um, the iPad would have to be behind me. And that's just kind of strange. Um, I'm just curious, are you seeing three images up? Uh, do, you, do you see a, an image of me or are you just seeing two? If anyone can let me know. On my devices, I'm only seeing two, which is fine. But... Um, if you can see me peeking in, I, on my uh, computer, I can actually see three images, and on my iPads, I can only see two. So, two only. Okay, thanks, Susan. Thanks, appreciate it. All right. Now, these, these trees up in here, um, they're, I need to get some green going. When I'm painting on location, I'll take a green with me. The green that I'll take is uh, Viridian because I can kind of push it towards warm or cool. And again, I'm going to paint very, very thin over these areas and just kind of sneak up on the color. I just want to get a little color sense going before I start to put any details in. And you can hardly see that color. If I were to bring it touch a white into that. Um, maybe a little bit more blue here. And create some areas that are a little more opaque. And you can see this is very wet. So this is a really soft approach. This is not sort of going in and trying to draw everything out ahead of time. Um, this is winging it for sure. It's a more intuitive way of working but i really like this because the random quality that you get from a palette knife um it's just a little more natural somehow or other uh thanks jerry um i see you you're seeing two uh as well and Rainu, i see you're seeing two as well 
Okay, that's okay. The, the third one that's blank is what I'm having to run my mic through. So it's just been a little bit of a complicated thing. I like the way that little orange pops through there. I'm not sure if I'll leave it. We'll see. Sometimes I'll have a couple of different colors on my brush at the same time just to create a bit of variety because I find that if you've got all the same colors everywhere going all over the place, then there's less variety. It's less interesting, really. Keeping it thin like this gives me an opportunity to paint thicker later if I want to. But there are times when I've left paintings this thin all the way through uh, because there's enough paint there to give some substance. And right now, just trying to get a feeling for where these things are going to go. Um, I like that color a lot. It's very tempting for me to go over it because I'm influenced by the photograph I'm working from. But um, maybe I can keep some of that nice, cool green that's happening there. When I say cool, it's actually a, it's a warm blue green, but because there's so much white in it, uh, it cools it down. Um, and just to give you an idea as to how cool that is, I'm going to take a little bit of CAD yellow and white and maybe just pick up a hint of manganese and I'll pop in a, a, a warm green right there and you can see the difference in that color right there um, so playing with warm and cool all the time it's really fun to do your if your light source is warm then your shadows are cool uh, and if you're light source is cool, your shadows are warm. So that's just something to bear in mind when you're painting. Um, I'm going to try and mix up a, a gray that works for the roof of this place. It's quite a cool color, but it is a gray. I'm going to use a bit of, um, this is raw umber. And it's a nice neutral kind of color, which you can push again towards warm or cool. And if I bring a little bit of uh, blue into that, and lighten it up, that should give me some of the effect of the roof. And I'm just going to knock this in, just see what it looks like. Uh, this is where I want to make sure my drawing is working. I'm not mixing the color up too much because if I do that, then I lose all that nice variety of value and chroma in an area that has a lot of texture. You can take a little brush and just go into this and kill some of those lights that I see. Really dangerous to get fiddly at this stage, but uh, it does need just a bit of detail. So I've got something to hang on to for the rest of the painting. Okay. Now when I'm looking at it from a bit of a distance, it's definitely lighter, but I can go back into that after and just lighten the values a bit where I need to. When I talk about values for anyone who's watching, who's painted, they know what I'm talking about. 
That's how light or dark something is. The lesson I gave last night was about uh, value uh, chroma, which is essentially the intensity of a color. And um, so value is important. Chroma is important. If you, if you don't neutralize your colors um, as things go into the distance or in shadow areas, then things start to look really garish and strange. Now, this little cabin is just like peeking through the trees. So the challenge is to paint around the foliage that I see. There's a really nice pink kind of ready color that comes into the top. Now, for some reason, something came up that said the mic was muted. I'm hoping you can still hear me. All right. Hi, Jerry. Nice to see you. Again, anyone who's um, watching this, if they want to let me know uh, where they're signing in from, it'd be just kind of neat to know. Okay, so I'm going to take a bit of a lizard crimson here because there's some of that color on the top of this roof. It's a metal roof, and it looks like at one time they painted it, and over time it's worn off. So there's just a hint of it there. It's a sharp peak, so I have to make sure I get that worked out right. I'm going to put a little bit of dark in behind it, darker green, a little contrast to get the shape of that working. So you can see the colors I have down there are not nearly as dark as that. Hopefully you can see that. Um, it's just pushing and pulling those values. Um, Jerry, uh, you're from Atlanta. Great. That's very cool. Wow. People from all over. Sheila, nice to see you, Sheila. I know where you are in Ontario. The Smith Falls, Perth area. And um, Susan from Edinburgh. Oh, isn't that great? Wow. Small world after all. Edinburgh is beautiful. Okay. Just get a couple of little lights happening in here. Um, right now I'm working with relatively cool colors. So... Um, I need to put in some of my highlights and a little bit of warmth in those highlights so I have something to compare to. I can compare my values. So I'm going to go in with some almost white. And never, never really use pure white um, because we don't see pure white in nature. Uh, maybe unless it's like a white cap on water or something like that. But... If you think about it, if it's warm light that's hitting white, then it's going to be influenced with a bit of yellow. Uh, or maybe even towards the reds or pinks if it's a sunset, for example. Um, and if it's cool light, then it's going to have some blues in it. So we don't really ever see um, pure white unless you have a color-corrected lighting situation that has a bit of warm and cool in it. Maybe when you first squeeze it out of the tube in those conditions. So you'll see I'm just using the palette knife. I mean, most of this was done with the palette knife um, as I got those textures going down in the beginning. So kind of it's, it's fun to carry on with that just to see how far we can take it. 
let the textures do the work. Trying to create variety as much as possible so that each shape doesn't look exactly the same as the next. I see a little bit of the blue of the sky reflecting into the metal of this roof as well. I'm just going to put a little blob in here. Okay. Now, one of the things when you're painting anything like this is you're really the master here. So you can move trees around. You can put in what you want and you can accent areas that you think you need to. And I want to go in behind the roof because I really want this to read like a building. And I'm just going to put some darks in here, which I can lighten later if I want to. I just want to get this working. So we have relative value relationships. And I have these really cool, nice, beautiful cedars or spruce or whatever these things are. I like seeing opaque and transparent areas working together. Um, you know, something like this here just picks up a, enough that says, well, I'm a tree, but you know, I really want you to look over here where the shack is. So it's that peripheral view. I talk a lot about peripheral with my students um, because the majority of what we look at or what we see rather is uh, peripheral. Um, we only see detail in the areas that we absolutely focus on. So when we're walking down the road, we're definitely not focusing on everything. We're just, you know, keeping our eyes alert. And if there's a sudden change, a sharp edge or change of color or something like that, then we pay attention to that. And while we pay attention to that, everything else goes into peripheral. So that's just kind of fun to think about. to bring that warm, well, cool red color down a little further here. I'll be happy to see you back, Baron, when you can. Yeah. Or if you want to look at the replay. That's a nice thing about... Uh, streaming this way uh, I don't have to edit anything so that works for my lazy nature um, but it also feels kind of more natural somehow I don't know Just some of these rich darks in here in this combination of brush for control where I need it. The other thing I like about working over wet paint, uh, sorry, over dry paint with wet paint is that it can take away stuff that I don't like. So, you know, I can go back in, I went a little too far in my drawing on that edge. So I can literally go back and just pull that area out of there. Hey, Todd, nice to see you. It's great. Hopefully you're still busy painting. This is a good time to be doing all of this. That's for sure. I met Todd at the Avenue Road Art School. I was taking a class from another teacher there, uh, Roberto Rosamond, who's an amazing teacher, a great artist. And, uh, some great, great people at the school. 
teachers and students. It's uh, kind of fun to do a painting like this on all this texture because um, the canvas is already beaten up. You know, it looks like it's been through a few bad days. And uh, it feels natural to paint into this. You know, we're trying to imitate the texture so we see. I can afford to put in a little more of that warm light that's hitting here. This picks up in a couple of spots. One of my favorite mottos is less is more. And if you can put in less and let the viewer figure out what's going on, you know, not so much less that they can't understand it, uh, but at least in figurative work, you're working with abstraction, it's okay. But even in abstraction, your shape should be interesting. Um, hopefully your colors too. Let's get a little more light going into this area here so we have a little more definition to this roof. Here and put a little bit of dark behind that again just to clean that edge up. Don't need very many sharp edges to make something look right. And again, trying to keep this as soft and as loose as I can at this stage. You know, there's a really nice little sort of a second roof in this little shack that has a bit of violet in it. So I'm going to grab some ultramarine blue, a bit of alizarin crimson, make up a violet. Notice I went into the, the yellow a little bit to lighten it, but it also neutralizes it, of course, because yellow is the complement color to violet. So just going to throw this in here, see what this looks like. That's about the right color, at least in the foreground. Then as it goes back a little further, it introduces a little of that blue. So it kind of changes up. And there's kind of a texture. This is kind of nice. Just going to run my palette knife through that a little. Hmm. It's kind of fun. I'm going to get another dark area here and I'm going to go a little to the blue side because again it's cool light, sorry, warm light, cool shadow. And just drop a bit of a, it looks like a doorway there. It's not actually a doorway. We were looking at this earlier, and it's sort of a, a fake wall built in front of this place. And there are a whole bunch of sticks hanging out of it. And it looks like they use these sticks for drawing things or something. Slowly, this shack is taking place. So 
sometimes when I'm mixing into dark areas, um, I just want to create a little variety in the color because even in your darks, you know, there's color. We don't look into the dark so much. We look into the light. But when you're looking at a painting, and especially think of the uh, Impressionists, who wouldn't be going as dark as this, as this here, by the way. Um, they kept all their values kind of above a gray, uh, mid-gray, like a number five, let's say. Um, but when you're painting even with values and you look into the shadow areas, you find that there's color that happens in there. And if there's not, it's kind of throw it in anyhow. They're like little surprises. It's one of the reasons why I like painting over wet paint, or sorry, dry paint like this. Look at that, right? Um, because all that color just kind of pops through and you get these surprising little areas that look really nice. I'm just mixing up a lighter blue right now. A little warmer blue and lighter because I want to start to define a little bit of the, the sky that I see behind, which is actually quite a bit lighter than what I have. There we go. All right, just see what happens here. One of the easiest ways to paint trees is to paint around them sometimes, at least the, the trunks anyhow. The foliage is a little different. Again, because there's so much texture already on this board, um, it just leaves some natural shapes. You take a palette knife and scrape away from it. It just leaves those little bits that are... Looks like you've been working on it for months. anyone has any questions while I'm doing this, you're welcome to fire away. I'll try and keep my eye out for any comments. Go towards the top of the painting. I'm adding a little cobalt blue. Uh, we go through sort of this range of ultramarine at the top to cobalt to the warmer blues as we get down towards the horizon. <laughs> so, Michael's, I like to your work but watching you paints like watching grass grow you know i actually called this watching paint dry so um yeah um this isn't like one of those time lapse things this is making time go slowly
we live in this crazy fast-paced world and i think one thing i have to say with covid it's forced us to kind of slow down a little bit um watch too much tv for sure but maybe work on some of the stuff we should have been doing when we we're out socializing before <laughs> maybe socializing is more important i get to do it again sometime that would be nice Todd's asked a good question. Um, you know, how, how do we adapt uh, colors and values when using a picture on a screen? Uh, because what we're doing is we're, we're painting with pigment, and of course, you, we don't have light behind it, which a screen gives us the advantage of. So in a sense, what we have to do is compress the values. Uh, we can only imitate what we're looking at. It's the same when you're painting outdoors. Uh, we can't replicate. We have to imitate. Uh, fortunately, we have color, warm and cool color to work with, and we can push those colors to, to give us a little bit more believability. But when I talk about compressing values, you know, we really have a range of 1 to 10 or 1 to 12, if you, depending on what value system you work to. Um, and it's up to us to maximize and simplify at the same time the values that we're looking at. So we are limited. One of the nice thing about painting is that uh, we also have one other dimension that helps us, and it helps us even over photography, and that is the texture. So if you have a painting that's painting fairly thickly and you put a light over it, the light picks up on our little raised areas. And that gives uh, another added dimension. In fact, uh, I always say the painting is really like a sculpture, maybe a very thin one, but it uh, has a sculptural element to it. So um, it's, it's amazing when you think about, well, if you take a Rembrandt painting and look at Rembrandt's work, and realize the depth of his shadows they're still very transparent you see into them um, and use the maximum uh, range of values but if you look you don't see any whites uh, and yet he was still able to pull off images that glow uh, if these guys had had the devices we have today they probably would have just blown us right out of the water can't imagine what they would do they were so limited uh, with their colors also. They had very, very limited colors to work with. Uh, Terry, you've asked a question about uh, the original textures. Um, this is a, an old piece of card, actually a thick card, and I covered it with gesso. Uh, and I just used leftover paint that I been working with through the week or weeks I, I do this fairly regularly where I just take scrapings from my palette and put them down onto a card like this so that I can paint over it later and I just like the random quality of that it's um it forces you to kind of paint around the things that are there and you get these nice little surprises that come through Uh, sometimes I've covered a really nice 
abstract with a really lousy painting. So, so now and then I, I sort of think maybe I shouldn't touch that because it looks nice as an abstract. Uh, Jerry, good question. Yeah, do I pick my pre-painted canvas based on planned painting? Uh, yeah, sometimes I do. I, if I've got enough variety of uh, old canvases kicking around, um, I do like to do that. If this one here lent itself well to the colors that uh, were in the photo that I'm working from, um, it just, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's tough enough to make it tough on yourself by working this way in a sense because you're working with color that's already there um so if there there are colors that are working for you um by all means pick up the the canvas that's going to help you um sometimes if there's something i have in mind i'll even take scrapings from my old my uh, palette and i'll put them in places where I think it will work for an image that I have in mind. I've done that too. This is where it starts to, to be a little bit fun because I can start to play with a little thicker paint here and there, peeking through and letting that foliage do what it's going to do. It takes very little definition this way to get something to feel like it, it's part of nature. And keeping a very loose brush to try not to grip it like it's a pair of pliers. Now the thing that's missing at the moment are some of the rich greens that I see uh, in the photo. So I'm going to try and mix up something that has a little more life in it. And I'm going to go with my Viridian here. I'm going to bring in some uh, cad yellow light and this is really sort of a dangerous thing because it can start to look sickly pretty which i'm not a big fan of so um i want to neutralize it a little bit so to neutralize the the uh, green i need to bring a touch of red um or maybe even a touch of orange just see what happens with the orange it keeps it warm, but it neutralizes a little bit because it's a, well, it's a triadic mix, right? So it's not another primary on the opposite side of the color wheel. It's, uh, it's a color that has some red in it, but it's not pure red. So just for fun, just see what this looks like. Okay, it's not too bad afford to go a little bit darker. You can see I'm not being too fussy with this. Just let the palette knife do the work. And I want to sort of bring a little bit of that color through into this area here. So that it has a sense of rhythm. I was looking for rhythm. There's a nice little light area that comes into the front of this building. And it's sort of it's warm, but not really warm. So I'm going to just pick up this wall right here. Again, very loose brush. 
barely touching the surface with this, by the way. Just letting the brush drag in a dry way over top. And that gives some nice texture. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for checking in. There's a little shadow that runs up the wall right about there. And that's a fun place to put in a little bit of cool color. And again, with fairly dry paint, I'm going to take a bit of a violet blue and just put that in here just to see what that looks like. Really trying to pay attention to values here and make sure my values are working. I like that color. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, Sophie. I should have some classical music on. That'd be nice. I have to listen to my voice droning on. one of those greens going and bring a bit of violet into the green. I went orange last time. So this is the other side of the triadic. If uh, you want greens that have some red in, you can go to the violet side as well, as opposed to the orange. So Green is one of those colors that so many people struggle with, and I, I do too. I'm, I'm no different. So when they work, it's like, oh, thank goodness it worked. Miguel has asked a nice question. Um, usually I try and paint over paint that is very, very dry so that it doesn't crack later on. In this case, um, there was old paint that was there a long, long time, but uh, just yesterday, or maybe the day before, I put some paint on top of that. And so I'm actually painting over paint that is semi-dry in some areas. And because I'm painting fairly thick, um, it should dry roughly at the same amount of time. So um, I, you know, I have this expression that uh, what we should do is really terrible museum quality painting so that we give restoration experts a job in the future. Maybe that's mean, but we we do get really overly concerned sometimes with conserving things. And yes, if they're masterpieces, it'd be nice if they all were. Um, but you know, I think of someone like Norman Rockwell, for example, who was painting very very quickly. Is you know, he's an illustrator. He had to get things ready for print. Uh, for the Saturday Evening Post, for example. And um, he writes that 
he wouldn't trust his own paintings. He said they might explode. Um, but they've managed to preserve his paintings fairly well. So in 300 years, who knows? So right now I have this area up here that's not working because everything is getting equal importance. You know, there's a blob here, a blob here, and a blob there. So I need to tie some things together. And I think what I'll do is go into this area here and just fill that in a little more. Compositionally, it'll make it stronger. So I can just go in like this. And already that makes it more interesting because now we have these holes that are coming through that are sort of more uneven shapes. Now this is a color that's not here in the original and I'm just gonna try this. I wanna bring this color over in behind so we have a sense of depth. Then I'm going to put some nice warm color up against that. So it feels like the light's hitting in that area. That is too strong, that dark right there. I'm just going to get rid of that. It's can't tell if it's a tree or the end of the building. So that's usually not a good thing. See if I can bring some warm green. Again, not mixing it up too much. I don't like to keep things too simple color wise. Just let some of the color intermingle on the board. I mean, this is something the Impressionists did. So those old guys taught us a lot of stuff. This creates a little bit of a backdrop there. I can afford to go even lighter and brighter. So I'm going to take a little bit of this bright cad yellow light and a bit of orange and just throw that in a couple of spots. It's a little more interest. And because I've done it there, I can afford to bring it into one or two spots up here as if the light's picking up, which it isn't from my photo. I can even take some of those colors up into the trees up in here. Now this is an interesting color right here. It's very neutral, um, sort of like a like a blah kind of color. It doesn't do anything, but because it is a neutral, it makes those other colors around it look a little more intense than they really are. So um, I, I want to leave that. Uh, I may even accent it more and put a little more of it in. Have a couple little branches coming up that looks to me like a, a raw umber maybe with a bit of yellow and a bit of violet so it's just kind of a let's see if i'm close well bang on 
that. How often does that happen? So it's like a a boring, burnt out kind of tree. But I think because it's so neutral, it helps. What else is going on behind it? I need a little dark accent in behind here. This is an important little corner right there. Thanks, Angela. Sorry, Angelica. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to try and bring some more intense chroma into the foreground because that will help bring things forward. It doesn't mean it has to be brighter. It just means it has to be a purer color, a little stronger than the colors that are in behind. And if I do this sort of thing here, it gives me kind of this grassy feel in the foreground. And I'm going to take a, a brush through this big brush and just kind of, again, let some of the textures that are in behind work their way through this. One of the things I'm always sort of preaching at my students is to um, allow a path to get into a painting. So, you know, if we're looking at the ground, we want to find our way in. And this kind of needs that. So I'm going to take another color, maybe that neutral color I had. Just a lighter sepia with a bit of violet and green maybe a little more of that yellow this is a cooler yellow this is on the ochre side it's the naples yellow it's again a color i don't keep often in my palette I just happen to have it because i was working on a portrait so i'm gonna see what okay it's gonna have to be lighter than that make this work maybe even a little cooler lighter again it's always amazing when you start mixing color you think you've got a light value and it's not until you well it's only when you put it up against the other colors that you really know that's more like it I'm just pulling this out into the foreground a little bit so there's a sense of a some kind of pathway going in here. Okay, so something's happening here in this painting that really kind of detracts from everything that's going on here. And what's happening is the outside is really busy. So I'm going to take a violet and I'm going to cool that all down. Just get rid of all of this stuff that's just really, and it can be loose. It doesn't have to be super tight or anything. But get rid of these lights. And I can add more detail in if I need to later. That's not a problem. But I just want to get, you can see once I do, I do that, your eye starts going towards the texture and the sharper edges and the areas of interest. OK. 
kill some of these whites that I see. Dangerous business, killing whites. I think I want to create a little bit of a dark area near the front of the, the front of the door. And maybe I can bring some violet into that. That also helps accentuate the path leading in. Now that's gone really sort of mucky. You know, it's a little kind of dark and gross. So um, I can bring more color into that. Add a little life. I'm going to create a, a nice violet. See lots of violet in shadows. We're looking for it. Especially if the light's warm, the source of light is warm. What's fun is to take um, the primaries that you're using to create a secondary color and put them in a, in a purer form. It's something I learned from the man who taught me, uh, Bill Biddle, William Biddle, who's a great illustrator. And uh, he could bring all kinds of color into areas and make life happen in areas that were pretty dull. So just, I can get a lighter violet going here and I'm even going to go into pure ultramarine and create a light color that happens in those shadows. This might be too light. We'll just see. No, I think it's fine. Sneak a little of that in here too. So in a sense, there's almost a bit of an impressionist feeling starting to happen with this. It's not impressionist painting, but you can still have interest in areas that would otherwise, otherwise be a little bit dull. Putting violets up against the yellows makes those yellows pop because they complement colors. Um, okay, so the other thing I'm going to do is create a little bit more volume in the trees that go up into the sky. I need to get rid of some of this paper towel here. I guess I'm one of those people who ran out during COVID and got a lot of well, paper towel, not necessarily toilet paper, but I uh, didn't want to run out of paper towel during the lockdown. Last uh, week I used this brush. I'll just show you this brush again. It's kind of fun. It's a cheap brush. I bought this in India. Um, but it's um, soft and it has this nice, you can get these really nice points and you can also cover large areas if you want to fairly quickly. And it keeps it loose. I'm going to go into a, a violet green. So I'm taking the violet that I had here, adding some green into it. And just going to start building some volume in the sky up in here. 
It's a little cooler color. I'm even going to build it in over here. This is a point where you can destroy a painting. If you do, it's okay. You just paint over it again. It's all right. Need to get some of these rich darks that are going on in behind here. But keeping color in it. I'll show you how this works with this really fine point that you get from this brush. You can just drag it down very carefully. Some nice thin lines. color in my brush. This is when I sort of just take a look at it and, and trying to figure out the things that it really needs. I'm really squinting down at it right now just to see the areas that need a little more attention. I think I could hit this right here. And there's a, an edge. Right now I'm looking for the, the sharp edges. So. There's one here as well. A little bit lighter than that. And it'll stand out. And a couple little accents. Dark accents. One is in here. There's another edge on the other side over here that's fairly sharp that comes off this roof line. And just to make sure we pick up on that, a little bit lighter right there. Funny, I'm looking at it on uh, my iPad because I can see it on my screen here as well. And um, it's funny when you look at things reduced down, uh, you can see things a little better. Sometimes it looks better, sometimes it looks worse. So if it looks good small compositionally, then it should be okay when it's larger. That's the idea doesn't always happen that way.
This area over here is bothering me. It's got a little bit too much violet in it. So I'm just going to knock that down a little. And there are a couple of confusing areas here that just don't work so well. I'm just going to bring some of these areas together to try and simplify. And here I'm just using a dry brush just to move the paint that's there around a little. Your darkest darks and your lightest lights are usually in the foreground. So if I punch in a couple of darks through here, that should help. Now, in the photo that I'm working from, the roof is actually covered a little bit with foliage, but I'm going to just do this because I think it just needs a little more definition. And then it stands up from the background a little better. Now it's going in and just killing values that are not working. really trying as much as I can to paint this as a whole, um, looking at the whole thing at the same time. Hey, Andrew's asked if I create the illusion of depth by using complementary colors or just light and dark. Um, I guess it's really both. Um, as things go into the distance, uh, they're affected by the atmosphere yeah, there's particulate in the air, so it gives you uh, lighter values. And the values, in fact, in the distance come together more. So, I'm, for example, this area right over here, if I just go over this a little bit with a little lighter color and soften this down, it's immediately going to make it feel like that goes back a little further. I can put some trees in front of that, which I'll do. But... Um, so your values is key. That's important. Um, when it comes to the complement color, when you go into the distance, you can use your complementary colors to neutralize the color. So it grays them. And that gives a sensation of, of things uh, going into the distance. Um, most of us have seen those photos of mountain ranges and you see sort of range after range after range and as they go back they get lighter and lighter and have less and less chroma so this is a, a way that we can create that sensation of depth as Todd was asking earlier you know we how do we get things to look anything like what we see from our iPad or with a device that has uh, light behind it and pushing those values and neutralizing colors as you go into the distance really makes a big difference it helps the play of warm and cool is really um, a lot of fun. It's, you know, if, if it goes well, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't always go well. Right now, I'm more 
about values at this stage than I am about color. I've got a lot of color going on through here, but these uh, value changes, the halftone areas and these areas that are a little sort of hard to know what's going on, you just want to just get the values working. Now you can see this area here, which I really liked, I liked the, that when we first started out, is competing now with this area over here. So if I hide that, for example, uh, suddenly that area seems to work better. And you can see that this is just a little confusing. So because it's in the foreground, this is a case where I can intensify the color. Uh, and um, let's see if I can make it work. Let's see, if, see if we can bring it up. I don't want it so intense that it just gets all your attention, but I want to bring a little more chroma into it. And I'll just, I'm going to experiment. I just hold my, my palette up to that, my palette knife up to that, and just uh, see if that kind of color might just bring it forward. It does, enough. It's still not super high chroma, but it's got a little more in it. And that brings our eye up into the foreground better, and it doesn't compete with that color in the same way. I can go a little bit lighter with that, add in just a touch of yellow, so there's a bit more chroma in the sense that it's not just one big dull area. I can get more light happening in this area here. Now, the amazing thing about the way we see is that we mix all this stuff together in our brain. You know, we're looking at something that's really blobs of paint. That's all it is. Um, but somehow or other, we're able to identify what it is we're looking at. Uh, because we're always checking for safety. And it sounds kind of strange, but we, we look at sharp edges because they're dangerous. And we look at soft ones second. We don't look at the sharp edges uh, uh, the same way we do soft edges. So like pillows are nice and soft and safe in marshmallows. Um, but... Uh, Glass, you know, broken glass and, and the edges of tables and sharp things, they, they're, we have to look out for them. So we see in order to preserve ourselves so that we're not going to smash into something that's going to kill us. And um, we can utilize that way that we see um, in our painting. So we can really do that. Thanks, Michelle. That's fun painting again here. And Margaret, nice to see you. Um, there's, this is actually a photo. I took a photo in Poland. And uh, so that's where the original of this is from. Um, but there are places that look like this in Canada for sure. going to have to come to Canada and check it out. Okay, now I'm getting a sense of light hitting here. Um, I don't want to get too many light areas going on. In fact, uh, I could almost afford to knock all of that down again. I'm just going to see what happens. It, Painting is kind of like walking a tightrope, you know? Uh, you can do something and just completely make a mess of it. And sometimes it works. So, you know, I always go for the time that it works. And if it doesn't, it's okay. Just as another painting I can paint over again if I hate it. So I'm going to go darker back here again. 
bring in some violet greens. Maybe I'll pop in a little bit of cadmium red this time. And just knock this area back a little more. There is a certain amount of intuition that goes with all of this, of course. Um, because you have to trust that when something's working and some something you know is you're happy about, you want to leave it alone. On the other hand, if you think it's just kind of yeah, any old painter can do that anytime blindfolded. Well, then maybe you need to look at it longer and do something special. So. Really making a mess of stuff back here. It's okay. I want it to feel a little bit wild and crazy. Um, you weren't in on this a little earlier, Margaret, I'm guessing, but uh, this brush that I'm using, I bought in India. It's a really cheap brush, and it's actually cut that way already. Um, you can take a regular brush and cut it, but um, yeah, th these are really economical. I got them cheap, and uh, I like them. They're they're very soft. I think I need to really punch in some dark back there without it being without it competing that's the always the issue with the other darks so if you want to make one area look lighter you make the other areas look darker thing about wet paint that's down is if I want to bring a lighter color in front of others just drag this brush through the wet paint and that gives me a sense of maybe some old trees that have died and or you know maybe some young ones coming up to be more optimistic It's starting to get a little bit towards the cute stage, um, which uh, a little too white. There's there's nothing wrong with pretty, but after a while, painting for a few years, you, you know, there's so many people doing pretty so well. Now this is a fun thing. I'm just going to take my palette knife here, and I'm going to scrape into the paint. And you can see I get these little lights that pick up here and there. And it just adds a little bit of texture and interest in areas. Works especially in the dark areas. But I don't want to get a too light back here because it starts to compete with all the lights that are happening up here. So that, for example, is a little strong. I can just tap over that, soften it down a bit. Um... I want to pick up on the light that's hitting the trees in behind a little bit over in this area, just in a couple of spots. And it gives that a sense of depth there. You're getting a bit of glare uh, as I see it from my screen, but um, you just have to trust me when I tell you it looks a lot better in real life. <laughs> I 
going to pick up some a bit of cool color to stand out against the back a little on the trunks of the trees. I don't need much of it. I'm going to put one tree that comes down into the foreground here. I need to put a shadow on that too. So I'll put another one in here. So it looks like this thing's been buried in the forest a long time. And then I'm going to take a smaller version of that brush that I had, the kind that I got in India and just go down the other side of it to create the shadow. That's one. And this two. Because the light's coming from that side, I also need to think there might be a shadow that comes away from it. Just a hint of one. Without getting fussy. Now that yellow there is a little bit too intense right now. I'm just going to take a part of it away. So it's a little less blobby looking. And maybe just cut through these yellows a little here. Now, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm going to attempt to bring another spot of color into here near that really black color. Um, and this is this could be really dangerous because it's going to be super warm color. I've neutralized a little, but I just want to see what it looks like. If I hate it, I'll get rid of it. Okay. Just to pick up on a little more chroma on one part of it. I don't know why it's an orange tree. So maybe it's starting to head towards fall. I don't know. It just felt like it needed a little more color right there. All right. Okay, we're getting into final stages here. I want to beat a dead horse, as they say. We bring a little bit more warmth into the ground right in here. So we make sure our eye is drawn into that area. And just pick up one little highlight near the door because that's kind of the focal area. And again, I don't paint with pure white, so I'm going to bring a bit of warmth into it. And let's just see if this works. Okay. A little bit more of that warm color right here. And scrape in a couple of branches. Okay, in the um, original photo, the sky is definitely lighter than this. The problem 
is that if I get it too light, it'll start to compete with what's going on in the light area here. I'm going to try and mix a fairly pure uh, blue and just lighten it a little bit and see if that helps. Just in a couple of spots anyhow, Let's see what happens. Maybe here. And have a couple of little places down in here. Light sneaks through. And maybe over here a little. Okay. All right, what are we time wise? 338. Okay, our time. Okay. Um, that's about as far as I feel like I'm going to take this uh, today. Um, I'm sure I could fiddle with this more, but the danger of that is, is that I fiddle it into nothingness. And there's enough paint going on here. If I really hate it later, I'll just paint right over top of this. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, let's just see. I, sometimes I look at something I've painted like a week later and I think, oh, Lord, what have I done? It's just like really all the stuff I hate. Uh, and other times I look at it and it grows on me. Um, there are paintings that I painted years ago that I wasn't very happy with. And today I look at them and think, well, actually, I think I was a better painter when I was younger. So... Um, Maybe I should hang on to everything. <laughs> um, thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Um, all right. So thanks for... I'm just going to come back to you here. Um, I've got to switch up my camera somehow. One second. Front camera. There we go. So I just want to say thanks to everyone for showing up today. Uh, I can't believe that there were like 600 and something, almost 700 views of the last one that I did. So um, if they start dropping off, I'll know that I'm not doing a very good job of it. Um, but I enjoy painting. And if you don't mind checking in and seeing what I'm doing, that's nice. It's, uh, I feel like I've got some company while I'm painting. And um, uh, hopefully... You know, there's something that you've learned if you're a painter. Maybe there are a few tips there that are helpful. Um, if uh, if you do like this, please uh, mention it to friends or people you think might be interested. There are lots of young artists who can't afford to take art lessons, and this is a nice way where they can just watch and maybe learn a few things. And, um, uh, you know, be safe. Um, and oh, uh, subscribe if you are interested to do that, or if you know someone else that might be. Um, be safe, be well. Uh, we've had a crazy year. Uh, hopefully, most of that craziness is behind us. Um, just don't really know uh, what's what's happening uh, out there. This new thing coming out of Great Britain doesn't sound very exciting. That's for sure, but. We just have to keep doing the thing that we do, uh, which is to stay safe and, you know, keep our distance from each other, at least for now. So thank you again. Um, happy painting if you're painting. And um, um, look forward to seeing you next week. I'm planning to do this on a regular basis, so stay tuned. I'll announce it on Facebook. And uh, uh, this will stream again. Well, actually, I guess it's recorded. Um, you can see this on YouTube and Facebook uh, uh, if you want to.
can stand watching it again. It'll put you to sleep. At 2 o'clock in the morning, you can start this up and listen to me droning on, and you'll fall asleep. So <laughs> uh, thanks a bunch, everyone, for all the uh, compliments, too. Okay. Have a great uh, evening for those of you who are in Europe, and I guess it's heading towards evening here in Canada. And thanks for checking in from all over the world. Take care. Bye-bye.